You know, we're talking about use cases in generalist repositories and obtaining your feedback will be hosted by myself, Rebecca Lee, and Christy Holmes, who are the co-chairs of this subcommittee. And we have a number of representatives here who will be talking about use cases. Next slide, please. I'll be giving a very short rundown of our agenda today. We'll be giving a, I'll be giving a very short introduction of Gray and our objectives. Uh, Christy will be providing a spin through the actual community, Zenodo, where the use cases live. And then we'll have a detailed walkthrough of the first set of use cases that we've been walking, we've been working through uh, this past year that's presented by the repositories themselves. And then a dedicated feedback section. So as you listen, would you please um, think about your feedback as we present today? Some things we'll be asking you about are, are these the right use cases? What are we missing? And could they be pre presented differently in terms of um, the format? When, what else could be, we be doing in the next year that would be useful to you and your team? Next, please. So, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what Gray is. Many of you are familiar with this initiative as we've been putting on a number of webinars. Gray stands for the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative that is funded by NIH. Our focus is really to develop collaborative approaches for data management and data sharing through funding of all of our Generalist Repository We've been working together and, and these are shown here. And our presenters today will be um, myself, Christy from Zenodo, Eric Olson from OSF, Sarah uh, Lippincott from Dryad, Lisa Curtin from Figshare. We have Tracy and Luca from Mendeley and Julian from Harvard Dataverse. I think it'll be very informative for all of you and we're looking forward to a really great agenda. Next, please. So in terms of our GRAY objectives, there are a number of objectives that GRAY has been working on today. Today we'll be really focused on what the use cases working group has been working on, which is developing this catalog of use cases um, and diving deeper into how the um, repositories can be used and, and some of their use cases from a roles perspective. Next, I'll turn it over to Christy, who will walk us through Zenodo as, and where these use cases currently live. Christy? Okay, great. Thanks, Rebecca. So we're going to be um, housing all of our materials in Zenodo. We've developed a Zenodo community for all of the research outputs. So not just these use cases, but also a number of other key project activities and products that have been developed as part of this GRAY initiative, uh, things related to metadata, um, webinar uh, slides and recordings and things like that. So it really does end up being a one-stop shop for you to be able to find any kind of material. So just to walk you through what that looks like, um, if you go to zenodo.org and click on the communities tab in the upper menu bar, which you can see here with the big orange arrow, uh, you will then go to a communities page. These communities pages are uh, really ways of bringing together different uh, different materials under the um, under a common theme or a common group. And so we've done one for Zenodo here. I mean, for a generalist uh, repository ecosystem initiative here. If you are on that communities page and you type in generalist repository ecosystem initiative, you can search for the community. And uh, what you'll get is uh, this page um, on the left of your screen where you see it's listed here. This can be a great way to look for particular uh, topics as well. But if you click view, then you get to the um, the page that's shown on the right where you can see all of our project materials and then you can dive in so for instance if you'd like to see the use cases for each of the repository platforms that will be discussed today you can um, search use cases and you'll bring them right up so um, 
I, speaking of use cases, we have four specific use cases that we'll be talking about today. Um, two of them are focused on researchers. So uh, the first of these is as an NIH researcher, I want to select a repository to share my data. Um, and we'll be hearing about that from both the open science framework as well as the Dryad teams. Um, we also think about researchers in the context of data reuse. And so our second use case is, as a researcher, I want to find research data of interest so that I can validate my findings, reuse data, and build on work in my discipline. And we'll get to hear about that from Figshare. Um, our third use case focuses on an institutional perspective. Um, institutions are often interested in reporting and understanding the work, especially around data set generation. So I want to report on all data sets from my institution so I can ensure compliance of research data sharing and management plan commitments. Um, and we'll be able to hear about that from our colleagues at Mendeley Data. And then finally, um, putting this in the context of the funder perspective. Um, I'm a funder from a specific NIH institute or a general funder, and I want to find data sets we have funded so I can report on compliance with policies and track the impact of research funding, uh, research funding and usage of data. And so um, our colleagues from Dataverse, uh, Julian, will be sharing that. So um, without further ado, I am going to now uh, turn it over to Eric from Open Science Framework, uh, who will be sharing the next, uh, the, our first use case. All right, perfect. Thank you, Christy. So um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about the OSF and how we enable our researchers depositing and sharing their, their data. So the OSF has a, a lot of similarities with some of the other tools you're going to see here today and some of the features it offers. Uh, the key difference or the key value for OSF is it wants to offer tools across the entire research lifecycle rather than any one particular phase of your work uh, as you're managing your, your studies. So planning and, and collaborating with your peers and sharing data have features for all of that in the OSF you can move forward. And in each of those phases, um, if the slide can progress, it might be slow. Um, but at each of those phases, you have needs for depositing data. So we make that really easy to deposit any kind of file types uh, into the OSF. Take you a couple of seconds to uh, just drag and drop your files into any of those workflows uh, across your, your research lifecycle. And then when you do that, um, if we move ahead, apply it again. Um, oh, we also enable you to, to connect to all of the storage providers or many of the storage providers that you use so that you don't, if you're collaborating with your peers, they're on Google Drive and you're using Dataverse, that's completely fine. Uh, you don't actually have to be downloading and uploading and having different versions floating around um, on the OSF using those same interfaces that uh, we just showed you. You can actually connect all of your other uh, storage providers to just that one workflow, that one interface. And you can all, all of your collaborators, no matter which institutions they're part of or or uh, where they're based, they can all interact with those files with you using those same interfaces. So a lot of our, our friends here in Gray uh, are integrated with the OSF, so you can use them uh, and the OSF in, in tandem. Um, so we can move forward again. Uh, and it's a little hard to read here, but um, the metadata that we enable for specific files, as well as the containers that you can build and define and, and put your data into um, all have extensive metadata. So there's examples of both here of, of metadata specifically for this file, of this data set here, um, as well as the container that was, that it's built within or that it's been added to. So lots of other data might be in that same uh, container and you can define each of those separately. So there's metadata there. So you can tell your readers who, what, where, and when um, the, the details of this particular data set. And then if you move forward, you can see on uh, one of the containers there that we have identifiers for all of those key uh, aspects, the DOIs for the objects, funder IDs for the funders, um, organ IDs for contributors, and institutional uh, ROAR IDs for the uh, affiliated institutions, which is gonna come back, uh, come back around in our next couple of talks here. 
Um, but they can also, if you have data that's taking place at all the different parts of your project and some of it is code, some of it's supplements, some of it's data sets, you can connect all of those to your uh, research objects here as well and define those relationships uh, so that whether they start on a data set that you have on Zenodo or if you start on uh, this pre-registration container here or on um, my, you know, your research institutions collected aggregated data, uh, you can always get back to this uh, package of identifiers and information about your data that you've uploaded and took a few minutes to define. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to you, Christy. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric. And now I'd like to welcome Sarah Lippincott from Dryad to share Dryad's perspective of that uh, researcher use case. Great. Uh, thanks, Christy. Um, so Dryad, uh, the Dryad use case takes a perspective of a researcher who has determined that Dryad is, is a good fit for their data. That's one of the first things that uh, that I think of when I think about this uh, use case of a researcher who wants to select a repository to share data. Um, there are a lot of, of uh, questions that go into determining what, what makes a repository a good fit for an individual researcher's data. So I think it's important for researchers to be thinking about and, and those who work with researchers to be helping, to, helping them to consider um, what repository is going to be a good fit. So in, uh, among the gray repositories, we all share a set of, of common features and we satisfy fundamental requirements like providing a DOI, or a persistent identifier for the data, collecting basic metadata to make it discoverable and reusable. But each repository will have somewhat different requirements, benefits, and limitations. So um, I... Uh, I'm using the example of Dryad here to kind of work through some of these questions uh, to determine what is the right fit for a data set. Um, thinking about questions like what disciplines are represented in my data? Um, so is this repository, um, does this repository have data that uh, uh, it, that is, uh, or is my data appropriate for a generalist repository or might it be appropriate for a specialist repository? Um, and does my funder specify a particular repository or does a particular repository make sense uh, of, for my data because of its content, subject matter, or, uh, or file type? Otherwise, a lot of the gray repositories are going to be a great fit where that disciplinary home is not available. Um, the, the other questions I to consider are what context is needed to reproduce, replicate, or analyze my data or research findings. This might include um, things like software or code, published articles, other data sets that might have been published in a specialist repository um, or another data repository. Um, as, um, uh, you know, as Eric mentioned, there's, there's more than just data sets that go into a research project. So uh, our repository, is the repository uh, able to accommodate other types of research outputs that can complement my data set and make it more reusable? Um, researchers need to be thinking about the ethical and legal implications uh, or, or, or limitations on sharing their data. So can the, dry, can the data be shared openly and without restriction on reuse, or does it need some sort of embargo or managed access? In the case of Dryad, all of our data is published under a Creative Commons Zero license, so it's not an appropriate fit for data containing personally identifiable information for, or other sensitive content. Other gray repositories uh, may be able to, to accommodate data um, uh, like that. Um, and finally, um, could my data and metadata benefit from quality control to ensure that I'm following best practices for discovery and reuse? If that kind of quality control isn't something that researchers have access to within their organization, Dryad, a repository like Dryad can offer that quality control or curation support for researchers. Next slide, please. Um, so once uh, once a researcher has determined that Dryad is the right fit, that really I think is the is is one of the harder parts of the process. We try to make it really easy from that point for a researcher to log into Dryad using their ORCID ID, upload their data, um, and receive a, a DOI. Um, enter metadata that makes their data uh, discoverable and reusable. 
submit it for our curators to check uh, to ensure that the data are appropriate and ready for sharing and reuse, and then uh, uh, be able to cite and promote their data um, in, uh, in perpetuity. Um, and that's, that's all for me. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And so now we're going to um, take a shift and think a little bit about looking for research data. And so I'm delighted to welcome Lisa from Figshare, who will be talking about that third use case. Lisa, take it away. Uh, thanks, Christy. And yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm happy to share how Figshare meets the needs of this specific use case, which is a researcher that's looking to find data for reuse to validate their own findings or otherwise build on existing work. Um, so I wanted to take you through a couple key features we have for finding data at Figshare. Uh, first up is our browsing feature here. Uh, when you visit figshare.com, you'll encounter uh, one of the, or you'll encounter this page of featured categories, these red boxes here. Um, and if you select one of them, you'll come to a page of subcategories where you can select as many of these as you'd like to kind of narrow what you're browsing through and effectively find research related to your subject. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and then moving on, I wanted to share a bit more about our search functionality. So if you wanna conduct a search on Figshare, uh, we have lots of different filters to help you narrow what you're looking for using these various facets here. Um, you know, the categories from the previous page are one of our fil filters as are a variety of other things, content type, item type, um, license type. And um, we do also, um, I wanna point out these two outlined in orange, the funder and publication year. Uh, those are the most recent additions to our search functionality, and they're a direct result of our work to improve our support for these great use cases. Uh, so continuing to build out the robustness of these search functions is key um, to not just facilitating finding reusable data, as in this use case, but to objectives of uh, most of the other use cases we're talking about today as well. Um, next slide, please. And finally, I just wanted to point out how Figshare fosters sharing and reuse of data once the researcher has found something they're interested in. Um, so this is what an item looks like in Figshare. And of course you can visit Figshare to have a clearer look at this of the full page. Um, but if, you know, once you've found something you want to use or share, um, we've included features on the item pages that streamline that process to access the data and share it. Um, so, for a lot of file types, you can preview it right in the Figshare platform. You decide right there if it's something you even want to download to reuse. Um, and if you do want to download it, you're able to download it directly from this page. Or if you're downloading you know, multiple files or you want metadata collected for whatever reason, we also allow um, or offer the option to download via our API. Um, and then we also have a citation generator. You know, A researcher can generate these in whatever form they need, and they can easily copy the DOI so they're able to reference things accurately. Um, and then if uh, a user has a Figshare account, they can save any of this data that they find that they might you know, wanna come back to later to a personal collection for quick reference. And then of course we have options for sharing on social media, email, and also for embedding this data or this item into whatever other page you might need. Um, so all of these features support uh, the reuse of data and help researchers find what they're looking for more efficiently. Um, if you want to delve deeper into finding data on Figshare and also into our advanced search functions, which I'm not going to go into here, um, I will share some links to our most relevant help pages in the chat for those. Um, and I just uh, I want to say I think that's about it for me, but at Figshare we're committed to providing this platform for finding, sharing, and reusing data. And we're, you know, looking forward to continuing this collaboration with all the other great repositories to support all of these use cases. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you, Christy. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, now we're going to look at our third use case, which is from the institutional perspective and reporting. So um, with that, I'd like to welcome Tracy to the webinar, who will be sharing um, a perspective from Mendeley Data. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, so yes, my name is Tracy Snowden, uh, representing Mendeley Data today. And um, our use case, we want to focus um, a little bit more on the institution. Of course, Mendeley Data is a free repository for researchers. Um, but in this particular use case, we're looking at the institution itself um, and their desire to be able to report on all data sets from their institution. And this is for compliance purposes, for data sharing purposes, um, for their data management 
development plan um, and uh, in order to honor their commitments to their researchers. I do want to mention um, that um, with Mendeley Data, we also have a funder filter search facet um, that can be leveraged to track one step further to understand that. Um, and Mendeley Data connects to digital commons data as well as data monitor, which I'm going to um, share a little bit more about. And those are offerings that can support specifically institutional collaboration at a higher level, um, as well as particularly um, the search and report function that we're focused on today. So next slide, please. Um, okay, so for the use case today, I want to introduce a specific persona. So we're going to focus at our friends at the University of Kentucky. Um, and we're going to walk through um, specifically three, um, three steps, three key steps or three key functions um, by which you can leverage Mendeley data in order to find your institutional um, data sets and report on them. Um, so the first thing we're gonna look at is the search query itself and, and how that functions. Um, secondly, we're gonna look at how you can manipulate that data using um, filter tools. And um, finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, data monitor and the ability to, um, to find that institutional data um, through APIs um, that can, can data scrape and, and pull that information into this, this single, um, single search bar. Um, final slide, please. Okay, so um, following those steps, if we look at, in the upper left hand corner at the big red one um, under in the search box, um, we would type in an all caps institution followed by um, open parenthesis quotation and then the university of your choice, in this case, University of Kentucky, um, close uh, quotation and parenthesis. And you'll see um, as you look down at number um, two, that um, you have about 3,554 results that come up for University of Kentucky. Um, those can be sorted by most relevant, they can be sorted by oldest to newest, newest to oldest. Um, and then um, with number two, we can filter those results in a few different ways. Um, so first we can filter those by publishing date. Uh, we have a, a, a slide bar here where we can um, drag to constrain those date ranges or we can manually type those date ranges in. Um, and we can also um, filter those by data types, a variety of different um, data types. And then finally, as I mentioned with data monitors, so as it turns out, um, uh, roughly 90% of institutional um, data sets are not within an institution's repository. So by coming to Mendeley Data or another um, repository within the GRAY initiative that has this kind of search uh, functionality, you can... Um, go across different repositories um, and this search query will pull that information in and that those are the results that are powered by data monitor as you see um, in with number three in the upper right hand corner uh, of the slide. So if anyone has any questions about this functionality, I'd be happy to respond to those in the chat box. I also have other representatives of Mendeley data. Um, Luca Belletti is also on the call today and would be happy to answer questions as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tracy. And uh, now we're ready for our final use case. We'll be welcoming Julian from Dataverse to um, share the perspective from Dataverse about the funder. Um, so as a funder looking to find data sets um, to understand how those are used, um, applied and compliance. So Julian, please take it away. Thanks, Christy. Um, so yeah, uh, I think a lot has been said about searching um, in different generalist repositories and, and the fact that, you know, uh, a search works. Um, there, there are things about searching that work uh, similar across the repositories. Um, so I won't go into detail, too much detail about different ways of, of searching. You can imagine all kinds of, of ways, but uh, for this use case, um, we, imagine what uh, a, a fictional um, administrator at, at, uh, at an NIH office um, would do if they needed to find um, data sets deposited in Harvard Dataverse uh, that were the outputs of, of research they had funded. And um, so th these slides show, you know, uh, how, you know, I, I think it's, it's likely that someone might try simply 
you know, pasting the, the number of the grant um, in Harvard Dataverse repository. So the further, for the first slide, it, it shows how, uh, you know, the, that, that funder administrator might have uh, seen, you know, a research article con uh, associated with, with the research that they funded. And then in the, in the data availability statement, they see a, a citation of a data set uh, published in, in Harvard Dataverse. So they follow that uh, a, a URL to Harvard Dataverse itself and decide uh, to search um, to see what other data sets uh, are published, might be published in the repository that uh, are associated with that grant. So they, um, they it's really small, I tried to make it bigger um, but you can see uh, they, they pasted the the the, the, um, the funding ID of that grant, and the search results show uh, ten data sets. Um, and then from there they can use facets uh, to narrow that search more. Um, and uh, you know, and then uh, you know, of course, they can use advanced search, which I won't I won't get into here either. Um, if they um, if they you know, as they're as they're looking at how data is described in the repository, um, they might imagine using different fields um, to search uh, for the for what's published in the repository. Um, so we hope that the, this use case is a. Um, is pretty simple, but you know, as we continue, you know, building on the, on this use case and learning from from funders who need to um, track uh, compliance with with, their, with the policies, um, we can uh, use that information to uh, continue to um, uh, help funders uh, find that you know uh, the, the research that they're funding more easily and, and how it's being used. Okay. Oh, that's, well, and that's it for me. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you so much, Julian. I appreciate that. Um, so now, um, we before we think about next steps or begin to gather feedback, we want to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions about anything that you have seen presented so far. So I do see that there's a question in the chat from Amanda French um, about um, the uh, Mendeley data monitor. Um, and uh, uh, Randy from Mendeley has answered that question also in the chat, but I wanna welcome others to put things um, in the chat, uh, in the question and a uh, answer section. Um, okay, we have a question from Isaac, um, from your perspectives, is there a trade-off between publishing data sets alongside other research outputs via special, versus uh, specializing in publishing only data when it comes to discovery, for instance? And he's had an easier time locating relevant data sets on repositories that are prior, prioritizing just data itself. So we're, um, Eric is typing in an answer for that. That's a great question because it kind of speaks to reproducibility too, right? So I think trade-off is the perfect way to describe that. Um, and um, so thank you, Eric, for typing an answer in there. Um, and then Rebecca uh, writes, what domain specific repositories does data monitor search and are they only in the NIH research area? So I'll ask uh, colleagues from Mendeley to weigh in on that, please. And feel free to unmute yourselves if um, sometimes it's easier just to answer rather than type in an answer. So, hi everyone. I'm going to answer the question about the um, discipline specific repository in Data Monitor. Unfortunately, I'm not a specialist on Data Monitor and for uh, mental data. I know that over 2,000 repositories are being indexed and added to the data monitors, data monitor corpus. I don't have details about which specific institutional, sorry, um, discipline specific ones, but considering the number of countries that are being um, indexed by data monitor, I would imagine that all the major ones, all the most important ones should be there. Um, I'm going to look uh, for the information in the meantime, while other people answer questions and I'll post something in the chat if I find something out. 
Thank you, Luca. I appreciate that. And we do have a follow up question about the Kentucky example. Melissa um, asks um, for more clarity about does the platform unify multiple presentations of the name? I know um, all of our librarian friends that are on this call are seeing this and wondering about the different ways that the same institution is presented, um, you know, which I think is a big reason why a lot of us are fans of Roar. So um, it, could you clarify a little bit about how the query is parsed when you type in in, um, an institution name? Does it pull in everything that's part of that organization? Luca or Randy, may I, may I defer that question to either of you? And I think, yeah, because I think there, Amanda had, had asked a previous question and Melissa's question supports that. Okay. So um, thank you, Tracy. Um, we'll circle back. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Randy says, no, at this time, the search will require you to include each rendition of the search text. Um, so thank you very much for that clarity. I think, you know, uh, speaking uh, just um, for myself here, if you know what you need to search, it's much easier just uh, to be able to approach the, the queries in a uh, intentional manner. So I think just knowing what those queries need to look like is very helpful. Um, uh, and let's see, we do have a question from an attendee about demonstrating how to search for a funder in Dataverse. What I'd like to do there, because we are sharing slides right now, is encourage um, you to take a look at um, the use cases, um, particularly the institutional use case, because those are going to be able to give you some perspective about what that searching looks like. Um, and you can see how the different repositories have uh, approached, um, you know, kind of getting through those uh, facets to be able to really drill into the data that's needed. Um, I do notice that Sherry in the chat posted an example searching for NIH in the Harvard Dataverse via the um, advanced search, and that link is there. So um, please do take a look at that, and I'd be more than happy to grab that for our repository. I'm sure others would as well. So um, yeah, thank you. All right. Any um, any other questions? Okay. Well, um, why don't we go ahead and um, transition to the feedback section, where we actually just really want to hear from you. Um, we're working to develop things that are useful in the context of not only these different generalist repositories, but really trying to understand what those primary um, uh, those needs are um, for people who are using the repositories. So, um, Rebecca, I don't know if you have, uh, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, if uh, you have anything that you'd like to, should we ask first the first one, which is, um, are these four use cases presented? Um, so we have the two for um, the researchers. Um, we have the funder. Um, and we also have um, the institutional use cases. Do those make sense? So are there use cases that you really wish you would have seen today? Then that's important feedback for us or, or how we can make those more useful for you. And also if what you saw today is, is useful for your role, please let us know. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I think, you know, um, this use cases uh, subcommittee has been really interesting because we um, kind of approached it with um, kind of an open mind. And, you know, this is the approach we decided to take. But, you know, as everyone on this call knows, I, any kind of opportunity to continuously improve is exactly what we're interested in. So um, we welcome all feedback. Um, 
uh, you know, with ideas, suggestions, or just this isn't working for me. Um, and I'd like you to take a look at it. Right. So I see things coming into the chat and that's exactly where we want these, this feedback. Okay, great. I, I see um, Chris Erdman, um, one comment I'll just highlight mentioned um, from the funder side, they're looking at the OA works and reports to scan for papers that uh, that they have funded and then um, and then using those papers as um, a way to search for the data software protocols in data seer. So that is a really interesting workflow. And, you know, I think it really speaks to that idea of um, this is a this environment. There's lots of different um, objects that are created, lots of different people and roles in this space. So um, that's really great. Thank you, Chris. All right, um, and we have uh, uh, Sherry, thank you for your mention of Dryad's um, use case checklist. Uh, yes, very helpful. It's it's anything that makes uh, the decision making easier is always welcomed by all of us for sure. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, your feedback is actually really um, important. And I think um, so Michael would have liked a little more depth. And I think, you know, it's always a balance. So it's the logistical, you know, transitioning between different repositories and being able to actually do live demos. I know I see a lot of people on the call who I know have ex expertise with live demos and know that the <laughs> never go the way they should. So, uh, but your point is very well taken and uh, that's a great opportunity for us for further um, engagement and reaching out and really giving you something to look at real. Um, the community of science presentation, because they had that little recording that really did, I thought did a nice job of showing what those workflows look like. So um, kudos to the team on that. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can think about doing that more often either a live demo or, or a short recording. Good feedback. Yeah, that's really great. Okay, um, so Heather asks an interesting question. Are data sets always linked to a funding number? I think ideally um, there are those some, some unique string of characters to be able to uniquely identify a fund. Um, or funding opportunity, uh, but I think different organizations, in fact, I'm confident different organizations manage that differently and different um, levels of funding. So for instance, if you receive an NIH grant, it might be different than a pilot award, let's say from your local CTSA um, hub. So, you know, those are managed uh, differently because of scope and, and just uh, infrastructure. Um, Okay, and Eric, thank you for your offer about uh, talking about uh, demos. Uh, it was really effective, so thank you. Um, okay, should we go to the next slide, Rebecca? Okay. Um, so as we think about this idea, so we've thought a little bit about what you've seen today, what do you want to see moving forward? So we pulled together some areas that we thought might be of interest for use cases. Um, collaboration, always the most important thing uh, these days in research, it seems. Uh, to hold true across domains. Um, and speaking of domains, any kind of specific disciplines that you'd like to see. Um, one thing that we're thinking a lot about at my institution is this issues related to security and privacy, particularly with um, uh, human subjects data. Um, integrations, uh, we heard, saw with the community of science team, they highlighted a lot of those integrations. Um, and so those would be, I think, of interest to understand what that integration looks like. Um, any kind of trends or standards, um, challenges and barriers are always where the um, real 
Um, I think Jem's lie is looking at what's not working and then thinking about how we address it. And then um, a lot of our uh, favorite topic for many of us on the call is the NIH data management and sharing plan. So um, so what are we, oh, we see um, Rebecca Heliophysics. Thank you for the suggestion of the domain. I appreciate that. Um, we can see, um, um, I'm watching the numbers pop up in the um, poll, and it's actually looking um, spread. Uh, there's good representation across all of these different topic areas. Um, yeah, so that's great to see. I mean, I think it really speaks that uh, to the general need that all of us have, no matter where we are or what repository or institution we work with, that there's like a need for capacity building and community building in, in all of these different areas. Okay. Rebecca, do you have anything you want to mention about any of that? And then I maybe I also want to see if um, Amanda will share the results of the poll when she is ready. Yes, I, I can see the poll, but I'm not sure if everyone else can. Yep, the poll is visible yeah. to everyone now. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Really appreciate everybody's feedback on this. Yeah, so it looks like people are really interested in, you know, specific challenges or barriers, emerging trends, technologies and standards, integration, security and privacy. Um, I mean, it's almost like an even, even spread across all of these things, maybe a little less so in terms of specific domains, but any of there's not much that is not interesting to people. All right, we've got our work cut out for us. Rebecca. I think so. <laughs> I think it'll be a busy year yep, in terms of future wonderful. use cases. So thanks so much for your feedback on all of these things. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And Maura uh, mentioned something about size um, and scale. So love that question. Um, that's something that I know uh, colleagues at Zenodo are thinking a lot about. So uh, we're happy to happy to see questions about size come in because they're a, it's a tough nut to crack. Okay. Um, so. Um, also in the context of feedback for future use cases, you know, so there's the kind of question or the domain of use case that you're interested in, but we also want to find out more about the persona. So what roles do you see in your ecosystem that we should be spending some time on as we start to dig in and really reflect these particular use cases? Um, so these personas can be researchers, students, administrators, any other kind of library roles, community roles. Um, so a lot of us are doing collaborations with community partners and thinking about meaningful context with data sharing there, I think is, is an important part of accountability and partnership. So uh, there's a lot of things that we can talk about there. Um, to, um, to, I guess, wet everyone's whistle about personas, we did include a few um, key resources to take a look at. Um, uh, colleagues, Sarah Gonzalez, who's also on, uh, on the Zenodo team for Gray, uh, led with a number of uh, colleagues from CTSAs and uh, libraries, a personas project. And so that's been recently augmented. There are 19 different uh, clinical and translational science personas, everything from ethicist to librarian to early career researcher and so on. Um, and we've put those into a Zenodo community. And the paper for that uh, for that work is list is linked below. Um, and then speaking of the CTSAs and personas, uh, we also mentioned personas in a paper that was led by Robin Champeau. Uh, it was a collaboration with several CTSA informatics teams around what do you need at the institutional level to um, support research data sharing. And so personas and user stories uh, played a role there as well. So, um, so check those out. And if you have feedback for those teams, please uh, feel free to give those. 
Okay, we're seeing some feedback coming in. Thanks, Lisa, for posting those links. Repository, Rebecca mentions in the chat, repository staff member linking to resources hosted on a generalist repository. Yes, we're, we think a lot about that at Northwestern, actually. Um, how do you create uh, a searchable um, a record that actually links out to secure data that's held elsewhere. So how do you show that it's part of the, you know, the work happening at that institution when you can't actually uh, maybe uh, make it available in the same ways that you typically would. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then alignment to um, NIST's um, research data framework, which is an interesting one. So that's also, there's quite a few interesting suggestions. I think we'll We'll have to take all these up at, in our um, next work group. Yes, absolutely. This is really great, everybody. Thank you so much for all of this wonderful feedback. Absolutely. Okay, so now uh, what is next for us? So a big part of, um, of this work that we're doing is really to reflect um, community needs, to be able to support people as they're thinking about sharing NIH funded work um, and uh, sharing data more generally in the context um, of the NIH data sharing ecosystem. So here's what we're thinking about um, as far as our next steps. As Rebecca mentioned, we have our use cases um, uh, working group meeting is, is coming up very soon, so this will be an important part of that discussion. Um, how do we build out our existing use cases to make them more helpful? Um, also, how do we incorporate real life examples? So um, many of us, Zenodo included, um, thought about this in the context of a more generalized account, but our, you know, our investigators around the country are doing amazing work. And so are there ways that we can highlight that work? Um, we want to think a little bit about those personas and roles and how we leverage them to make sure that we're um, being intentional and thoughtful in how we're representing the work in these use cases. Um, of course, we'll be reacting to your feedback and, and you'll be uh, hearing more from us um, through the great communication channels. Um, and then uh, we will also be looking for additional opportunities to engage. Um, do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, an idea, you want to chat, anything like that, because that's really what we're here to do. Um, okay, and now uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca, but we also want to invite you to have next steps too. So Rebecca? Yeah, of course. I mean, these are all things that we would love to have you join us. And um, we have next steps in joining us for the next webinar, collaborative webinar series, um, registering to attend and reach out to us for any additional ideas for engagement. We've shared our emails with you and would love to hear from you. If you think of anything else after this meeting, oftentimes after a meeting, I'll think of some ideas and we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you think of anything afterwards, please reach out to myself, Rebecca, or, or Christy, if you have any other ideas, we'd love to hear from you about the use cases or any other feedback you might have. Christy? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, we're really excited. Um, we are having a number of ways to keep this engagement up with the community. Um, there's a metadata recommendations webinar that's coming up um, in mid-September. And I would just like to, you can register at that link that's on the slide and we'll send these links out. I see that there's some challenges with pulling the links out of the chat. So we'll send those up as a follow-up. Um, the other thing I wanna suggest is that if there are webinars that you think would be particularly timely or that would reflect uh, priority areas that you and colleagues are identifying, don't hesitate to let us know that as well. And we'd be happy to uh, see what we can do. Okay, well, um, with that, um, we would like to thank everybody for your time and energy and all of this amazing feedback. This has been really terrific. Thank you. 
Um, uh, and I, on behalf of Rebecca and myself and our entire Gray collaboration, thank you for your time and your feedback. And uh, we'll be following up with um, some additional information shortly. Thanks, everybody.